obviously your state did not shut down, mm -hmm. uh, which was at the time a very, very, very risky decision. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do some questions now from our audience, and we're going to start with uh, our friend Don Lee. Sure. Don. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, uh, Governor, did you feel pressure from other states, uh, from within your state, uh, from the federal government or other institutions to shut down South Dakota during COVID? Uh, on the other hand, who supported you while making your decision and helping you stay strong in your decision? Hmm. Well, I would say yes to all of the above. <laughs> there was a lot of pressure at the beginning of 2020 when the virus was hitting this country and hitting all of our states. You know, I think I did what every other governor in this country did. You know, we all studied the virus and talked to our health experts. We watched as it hit other countries and talked to each other a lot uh, as we were preparing. I opened an emergency operations center a couple of months before we ever got our first cases in South Dakota. But then I, I believe I took it a step further than a lot of other leaders did. I spent a lot of time with my general counsel and with a, attorneys who specialized in the Constitution. I really wanted to understand what authority I had as a governor and what authority I didn't have. I, I've just been a big believer consistently that when you have a leader that oversteps their authority, and especially in a time of crisis, that that's when you break this country. And I didn't want to be that leader. So I, I stood up in front of my people, I remember, in that first press conference, and I told them, I said, listen, I'm going to give you all the information that I have. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you the science of the virus that I know, the data, mm -hmm. the, the support, the help uh, that, that we can do as a state government, but then I'm going to trust you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you use personal responsibility to make the best decisions for your family, but let you put food on the table and, and keep your business going, take care of your employees as well. And overwhelmingly, our state responded in mm -hmm. an amazing way. So we never once closed a single business. In fact, I never defined even what an essential business was in South Dakota. I just right. didn't believe the government has the authority to tell you your business Because then you're picking essential. winners and losers, right? That's exactly yeah. right. And where does it stop? And, and then never issued a shelter in place, never mandated anything such as masks. I just said, I'm going to trust you, and we're going to get through this together. And, and we did. It's phenomenal to hear what was happening in our state. I'd say that my biggest support, which was a part of the question, uh, was definitely my family and my faith. Sure. I had a trust in the people of South Dakota. I know their character. They're the best people in the country. That, and I knew that they were, knew how to work hard and, and cooperate to get through challenging times. Sure. And then my, my family and my executive team in my office, even my health care systems, we just all stepped up and cooperated very well together. But, but I want everybody to be aware the reason that happened is because we communicated right. consistently. Right. I spent 20 hours a day on the phone calling leaders, calling my health care. And I did it myself sure. and spent a lot of time. I think that was the key to us is that uh, we worked together to find solutions and didn't just follow the crowd of what was happening. Understood, yeah. We have another question regarding sure. COVID. This is from Grace Fundaro. I hope I have that right. A uh, senior at Westmont College. And you want to know what's it going to be like going into, I guess, a work world during COVID-19. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, Governor Noam, my mm -hmm. question is, given the intense government overreaching mm -hmm. we've seen, particularly in California, guised in the name of safety amidst COVID-19, how can those of us looking to enter the workforce post-graduation safeguard our freedoms against arbitrary state, local, and institutional mandates? Well, just remember that our founders in this country gave you the power. They trusted you more than they ever trusted the government. And don't lose sight of that. I think that so many times people today are calling on the government to come in and solve all their problems, when really the power was given to the people. And the, the founders envisioned that the federal government would be extremely limited and that every power that wasn't especially enumerated there was given to the states and local governments and to the people. In South Dakota, our motto is, under God, the people rule. And I did a whole press conference just talking about that state motto and what it meant and that the personal responsibility that people have to meet these challenges is incredibly important. So, you know, I would, I would consistently thank you for wanting to work. I think that, I think, <laughs> first of all, thank you for that. Um, it, it concerned me. Listen, this is what alarmed me during the pandemic, hmm. is that how the media 
and liberals used fear to control people. Right. It's an opportunity they, to grab power. It is. This is what it this is. has been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I watched the government tell people that they couldn't get together and have meetings, so they gave up their freedom of assembly. Mm -hmm. I watched them tell people they couldn't go to church, so they gave up their freedom of religion. I watched people hear that they can't say certain things or do certain things, and they gave up their freedom of speech. Yeah. Uh, people just rolled over and did that. And, and we need to start educating uh, folks on what the role of government is and what it isn't. And then stand up for your freedoms, because yeah. we're just one generation away from watching it go away if we don't consistently teach our children the value of those freedoms and what success they've delivered for this country over the years. Give up a few freedoms, take a few free things from the government. It sounds like a good deal to a mm -hmm. lot of people that don't know any better. That's a scary That's thing. I want to change. I want to talk about the border. We, we've seen the situation under the Del Rio Bridge mm -hmm. in Texas. Mm -hmm. We've had about 12,000 Haitian migrants that yeah. have come up that have been living in South America or Central America. Mm -hmm. They're not refugees. They've been just in a different country and now they want to come to a better country, released into this country. They get court dates. Many of them are not going to go to those court dates and just disappear mm -hmm. into the country. Our next question is from retired firefighter Paul Miner. Paul, good to see you. Thank good you so much. Good to see you, too. Hi, Thank Paul. you, Governor. Uh, with the Biden administration's open border policy, along with the recent arrival of people from Afghanistan, how will you deal with this ongoing immigration surge to ensure the people of South Dakota are safe and this does not become a societal or financial strain on your state? Well, there's consequences to those decisions that will impact my state or regardless. It's just going to happen because of, we're in this country and, and those consequences are going to be long lasting. But we're one of the three or four states that is not getting any Afghan refugees right now. And it's, I've taken a very strong stance that the Biden administration is not vetting these individuals like the Trump administration did. We don't know who these people are. We don't know if they love America. Nobody should come into this country unless they love America, unless they want to be here, be a citizen, and embrace the ideals that made this country great. Uh, I deployed my National Guard to the southern border when the governors of Texas and Arizona <coughs> asked for help. I sent my National Guard because they are used to going to war. And let's make no mistake that what's happening at the southern border is a war. It's a war zone. And we're, the federal government's not enforcing the law. They're not keeping people safe. And my National Guard was best suited to go there, complete the mission, work with other agencies, do a job, and make sure that they could come home and be successful. Now, they were there for 60 days, and they're home for a period of time, but they will redeploy under a federal um, deployment here in mm. October uh, to facilitate trying to enforce the law there. But what we have happening at that border is, is devastating to our future. Not only is it yeah. allowing people to come into this country that we don't know if they want to harm us or if they want to be like us, mm -hmm. we're also facilitating drugs and human trafficking that is going to impact my state. Um, I have uh, in South Dakota, the vast majority of the drugs that come to the Midwest are facilitated through some areas of my state uh, that are tribal lands that I have no jurisdiction over. And from there, it's dispersed and impacts uh, many, many states throughout the Midwest. So if my guard could be there and help stop some of that at the border, then that was a good thing for my state as well. And I, I ask this question all the time on my show when we talk about immigration. What do you think, and let's look at all Americans, mm -hmm. no matter what your political mm -hmm. stripes are, what percentage of Americans agree with a border policy like this? Agree oh. with just allowing 12,000 people, relatively unvetted, mm -hmm. no COVID vaccine, mm -hmm. wander into our country, mm -hmm. you know, and you give them a court mm -hmm. date and you expect them to come back. I mean, let's get real. What percentage of Americans do you think agree with that policy? I would say very few of them if yeah. they were answering honestly. Right. I would say right. less than 20%, and those 20% maybe just have not done a true analysis of what the costs of that are. Yeah. Uh, these folks, and even my guard said that many times, they would go um, identify illegal aliens. They would be then told to turn them over to Border Patrol. Border Patrol would turn them over to NGOs who immediately would put them on buses or planes and fly them anywhere in the country to be lost track of. And it was happening over and over and over again, and that is the policies of Joe Biden. Yeah. That is what he wants to have happen to this country, and it's unacceptable. Yeah. A well, nation without laws, without following its laws, without borders, yeah. isn't a nation at all. Yeah, every other country watches this and is mm -hmm. just astonished. Yeah. 
at the stupidity. I mean, we, every country has a border. Mm -hmm. now, well, you can't, you can't wander into anywhere. Yeah. It's a humanitarian crisis. My, yeah. my National Guard soldiers were telling me stories of they would watch these little children being carried with a group of people, yeah. and they knew those children didn't belong to these men. They knew they didn't. In fact, they would see the same children several times that were just, they knew because they couldn't be held um, and detained if they had a small child with yeah. them because then they were, um, you know, unaccompanied minors They're and protected. that they had yeah. to, a different way that they were handled with the federal government definition. So, so they, they knew this wasn't a family situation, yet they were powerless to really do much to go in there and overstep what the federal government was dictating they do. And speaking of the, the humanitarian side of this story, mm -hmm. uh, retired executive Barry Goss mm -hmm. uh, with a question on that. Barry, thank you so much. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Um, America is a compassionate nation. Mm -hmm. So how do we send an accurate and consistent message on immigration to countries like Haiti, mm -hmm. whose citizens are literally risking everything to come here only to be sent back? Well, we certainly do it by addressing our immigration system and making it possible for people to come here legally. You know, we all know and admit that our immigration system is not working efficiently. Um, and we're very proud of people that come here and go through the process of doing it legally. Um, but we also need to make sure that while they're coming to that border, that we're sending the message before they ever send the, take the trip, before they ever put their children in jeopardy by putting them through that challenging trip that they take to the border to let them know you can't come here unless you follow the legal process. And that's not the invitation and the, the guidelines that the Biden administration is sending. They're, they're sending the message, come, come, and then they're turning them around and sending them back, with a, which is a tragedy for those individuals that are there. And, you know, I, I think about this all the time. I, I don't think that this country was ever designed to be a welfare state no, when, when, it was, no. when it was initially brought up. I just don't think that was a design. If you want to take on refugees, if you want to take on people from other uh -huh. parts of the world, bring them in, but they have to, you got to figure out how to make it. Now that we've, we've changed this country, we have right now, there's pending legislation mm -hmm. that could give free college, mm -hmm. you know, free health care. Mm -hmm. Uh, free elder care, free child care. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of stuff that the working Americans have to pay for from other people in this country already. To bring in more people from around the world, mm -hmm. you're going to have a flood of refugees uh, if you continue on this path. So, so what do you do? You know, because the liberals love to say, oh, well, we've always taken in people. We took in the Italians, we took in the mm -hmm. Irish. Yeah, but at that time, in this we country, you didn't job. get anything for free. You we came here and you job, had to work. Or yeah. we gave them a piece of land and said, go make a living. Yeah. Go provide for your family. We'll give you an opportunity yeah. to be successful. And that's one of the things that, um, that has changed in a lot of this next generation that's coming is a sense of entitlement. Yeah. Um, that that government payment is needed. In fact, we were the only state in the country in South Dakota that when the elevated unemployment benefits came forward from the federal government, that, that I told the president, thank you for that flexibility. You know, I appreciate it, but we don't need it in South Dakota because our people want to work. And they did. I have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. In fact, today, I have around 1,000 people in the entire state of South Dakota that are on unemployment benefits. That's in the entire state. And in all of this, mm -hmm. I think the, the big question is you, you have a vice president right mm -hmm. now who you can tell is just sitting there yeah. inspiring about 2024, yeah. watching you know, the president uh, fall apart. And you <laughs> see that. And, and I think the biggest job she got is the border. It is. And, and, and it's just been an utter failure to watch. And, and we need to be there reminding her that she was yeah. given a responsibility and she was so weak she wouldn't even take on that responsibility and do her job. She's so weak. Um, and, and that's the biggest challenge. Listen, in our state, when I ran for governor, I talked about the fact that I wanted to build stronger families because I think that a lot of our challenges in this country is from a breakdown of the family. I don't really care what your family looks like. I just want you to love each other and support each other. Yeah. Uh, and also I talked about the fact that I believed South Dakota could be an example to the nation, that I believed we could do things in our state that other states necessarily maybe weren't willing to do, and use that as an opportunity to show that what we believe as conservatives really does work. And, and that's what I think leaders do, is take on a tough job and show that it creates opportunity for people. Mm -hmm. And what she's doing is because she thinks it's political baggage, is ignoring the problem and not dealing with it. If you get that job tomorrow. What job? Her job? Borders are. Borders you, are. Let's, let's fix well, this problem. Well, I would problem. change the title, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what, what, but yeah. what, are the, what are the first things that you implement if you get, if you get this job? 
I would go back to the Trump policies that he implemented to secure that border. Um, we have to have a secure border, and the message it sent was important. So, re remain in Mexico, mm -hmm. um, no third country, Absolutely. you know, it's like with the Haitians, for Absolutely. example. I mean, you have people that were living in Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, people that were living in, in you know, Mm -hmm. uh, various Colombia. Yep. I mean, these are not countries that, that spawn refugees. Right. These are no. not places where their lives are in danger. And he stopped people from coming that didn't love America. Yeah. He made sure that if you don't want to be like us, if you don't love this country, you shouldn't be here. Yep. Uh, the citizens, the people who live here, recognize that this is a special gift, mm -hmm. a special blessing to live in this country. Yep. You just watched Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news channel now in more than 70 million homes. You can get Newsmax TV on your cable system or check your cable guide. And if your system doesn't carry Newsmax, call them, tell them you want Newsmax TV because we're real news for real people.